Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar, where we'll be exploring the history of Barren Island, a very unique place in Brooklyn's history. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and staying healthy, and whenever possible, staying home. Um, and if you don't have the option to stay home, then please stay safe. Um, my name is Bo Mendez. I'm the Programs um, and Communications Manager at uh, Brooklyn Historical Society, so I have uh, the distinct honor and privilege of welcoming you all here to tonight's webinar. Um, we'll be introducing our speaker and handing her the reins in just a moment, but before we do that, I'd just like to share a little bit about who we are. Uh, Brooklyn Historical Society is a 155 plus year old institution that's dedicated to uh, recording, documenting, and sharing the history of our borough um, and making that history accessible and relevant for both people in Brooklyn and anybody else outside of Brooklyn. Um, and while we document the history of Brooklyn, that includes documenting the current moment in history. Um, I would just like to say that we have started a collections initiative uh, that is documenting how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us here in Brooklyn. Um, at this time, you can visit our website, brooklynhistory.org, and learn how to submit your um, photos that you've been taking, any writings you've been doing, video, audio clips, all digital materials. We do have plans to also accept physical materials. This includes things like signage, artwork, if you've been making, making any. Uh, but of course, right now we are closed to the, our building is closed to the public, so we can't accept this, but we hope to in the near future. Uh, so, um, we invite and encourage you all, if you are journaling, documenting uh, things that are happening right now in any way, shape, or form, and you want to share that with us, uh, we are definitely encouraging you to do so, and we have things set up for that. Uh, you can visit our website for more information, um, and we uh, hope that you'll join, in, join us in this because, you know, your, your history is Brooklyn's history. Um, so on to tonight's topic. Uh, we will be exploring the history of uh, Barren Island, uh, which was um, currently is now the site of uh, part of Floyd Bennett Field, uh, but was once the site of a large citywide uh, landfill, uh, but also the home of a community of people who worked on, lived on uh, that landfill area and turned it into a community and uh, actually even an industry. Um, and to walk us through this history, we brought uh, Miriam Sisherman, who wrote the book Brooklyn's Barren Island. Uh, I put in the uh, chat down at the bottom of your screen uh, information about how you can purchase the book if you'd like to learn more. Uh, it is out now through the History Press, and you can order it direct from them, or you can order it from your favorite local bookstore if they're doing any online ordering. Uh, I believe the Indie Bound also has it through various outlets. Uh, but if you want to learn more about this story, you can pick up the book to do so. Um, I'd just like to share a little bit about how this evening is gonna work. Uh, in just a moment, I will be bringing Miriam on who will be sharing uh, the history that she's collected as well as images in a presentation. Uh, she'll be doing that for about 45-ish minutes or so. Um, and afterward, we will open the floor up to take some questions. If you have a question, you can submit it through the Q&A box, which should be located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll make sure that those questions, as many as we, as we can, um, have time for, make their way to Miriam. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Miriam Sisherman is a 21-year resident of Brooklyn and a longtime public elementary teacher at Children's Workshop School in Manhattan's East Village. She developed an interest in garbage when her students discovered discarded artifacts as much as, a, as old as a century in their classroom closet. This closet archaeology project has become an ongoing excavation and research activity. When she learned about the scavengers and garbage processors of Barren Island, Sisherman made their neglected community the focus of her history master's thesis at Brooklyn College. So she knows a thing or two about this story. Uh, this book evolved from that work. Uh, Sisherman is also a graduate of Oberlin College and the Bank Street College of Education. She lives with her daughter about seven miles from where Barron Island used to be. So uh, bear with me as I bring her on to the screen, uh, but please uh, welcome uh, Miriam Sisherman.
Hi, am I visible? I hope so. Um, uh, thank you, Bo, for that introduction. I am really excited to present tonight about Barren Island and to read a bit from my book. And I'm very grateful to Brooklyn Historical Society for making this program, which was originally supposed to be in person, work under these circumstances. So I'm going to actually start this talk with an anecdote. Uh, it's a bit different than how I might normally start it. But there's this anecdote in the book that relates to what we're going through now. So I'm going to try sharing my screen to tell you about this. Um, so just a moment. All right, so this is Jane F. Shaw. She has become a hero of mine because her work, of her work on Barren Island, and I'll describe a bit more about her work later. Um, but what's relevant here is she was a New York City public school teacher on the Lower East Side when she was recruited to work at the island's only school, PS 120, in 1918, a year that might feel familiar to us right now when the Spanish flu pandemic was still going on. Um, there was no medical care on the island. There never had been and there never would be. Um, Shaw and the other teachers at the school organized milk delivery and other services for the islanders who had almost no municipal services whatsoever. Meanwhile, there was a new school custodian named Noah Decker. He had just arrived. He was assigned to the island against his will and he was very devastated at being posted in this remote stinky place. Uh, but Decker was so inspired by um, the response of Shaw and the other teachers to the pandemic and how caring they were toward the islanders that he actually ended up staying on Barren Island for the rest of his life voluntarily. He organized a volunteer fire company. He taught the children about wireless radio technology, as well as doing his job keeping the school building clean. So I just want to take a moment at the beginning of this talk to thank everyone now who is an essential worker or who's otherwise helping other people during our current pandemic. And I hope that their work will be inspirational to others just as Shaw's work was inspirational to Noah Decker. This is, whoops, hmm. it is not letting me go to the next slide. Just a moment. I'm gonna try that again. Okay, sorry. Um, let me try sharing it again and we'll see if we can make it work better this time. Let's see. Okay, now it's working. Sorry about that. So I wanted, this is just a general shot. I don't know what this building is, but it gives you kind of a sense of the landscape of Barren Island. And I want to just give you a bit of context before I read from the book, I'm going to give you sort of a mini history of Barren Island. So um, in a nutshell, it's where a lot of the city's garbage and dead animals, of which there were many, were processed and converted into useful products from the 1850s until the 1930s. So it was definitely not just a landfill, it was a garbage processing and a dead animal processing place. There was, so there was a community there of the workers and their families. And in my opinion, the community is really fascinating. It had never really been studied before. And so that's what my book focuses on. Um, and so first I would also like to give you a sense of where it was. As Bo mentioned, it's more or less where Floyd Bennett Field is now, but the land has changed so much. So this map is from around 1900, which is soon after the five boroughs consolidated into one city. And so you can see Barren Island here. It doesn't look particularly remote, but most of this part of Brooklyn was not really developed and it was extremely marshy. You really couldn't sail a boat over here. If you wanted to get to Barren Island, you had to take a ferry all the way from Canarsie, which as you can see is not that close, but it had sort of the clearest path through the water to Barren Island. Um, and then, uh, so you can see that sort of the macro view. And then if we zoom in a bit, this is Flatlands. Um, Flatlands was one of the original six towns that later became Brooklyn. It was settled, it was called originally New Amersfoort because it was settled during Dutch days originally in the 1600s. And it became part of the city of Brooklyn in 1896. And then in 1898, when the whole city consolidated, it became part of New York City. So this map is from 1873, when Flatlands was still an independent town. You can see this is Flatbush Avenue. And at the time, it ended right here, which I believe corresponds to Avenue U nowadays. And on this map, you can really see how marshy it was. This is just all marsh. So you can see that it really was not doable to get from here to Barren Island on a boat or in any other way. And this is the island itself. This map is from 1899. You can see that the city owned this chunk of land. Eventually, the city would almost own the entire island. Um, which became important, excuse me, important later in the story. 
Um, and um, the, so the people who lived there rented their land from the city. They owned their actual houses, but they rented the land. Now this map looks really different from a lot of other Barren Island maps because the island changed its topography so much over the years. Like you can see this creek goes all the way through the island at this point. On other maps, it only goes part of the way through. The shape of the island changed constantly. There were always um, pieces of the island that would fall into Jamaica Bay. Um, it, changed, it was really low lying and marshy, so the shape of it would change with the weather and the tides. So life on the island um, was all centered around the factories. This is one of the garbage factories and you can see back here like a boat being unloaded and this guy kind of showing off as a daredevil standing up here. The other big industry on the island was dead animal processing. This photo is from after this factory had closed. You can see it's kind of hollow inside but I wasn't able to find a picture of the horse factory from when it was actually functioning. Um, and Basically, thousands of horses died every single year in New York City in those days and would be processed. And I'll read to you a little bit about the many, many, many products that the bodies of horses were made into. Also many dead dogs and the occasional other animals. An alligator that was found in the sewer ended up at Barren Island. So occasional Bronx Zoo animals and things like that. And the other big industry that lasted on Barren Island until about 1900 was fish oil processing. And that was considered a nuisance industry as well because it's so smelly. Um, and then the fish catch dried up around 1900 and those factories closed. So anyone who lived there, I'm sorry, anyone who worked there had to live there. It was impossible to commute. You could take a ferry from Canarsie, but only if the ferry was running. And oftentimes weather um, would stop that from happening, whether it was that Jamaica Bay was iced over or it was too windy or it was too stormy. So you had to live there if you worked there. And the community at first was just men living in company dorms, but very quickly men started to bring their families and it became like a real little village. It had to be very, the people who lived there had to be very self-sufficient because you just never knew when you'd be able to leave and when you'd be able to come back. So if you went shopping in Canarsie for the day, you might not make it home in the evening if the weather turned bad. Um, and I'll so explain the different buildings in this in a moment. Um, this is a really nice sort of panorama of the island that gives you a sense of the landscape again very sandy and scrubby. So there was a public school from the 1880s and there were two churches um, and apart from that there were really no institutions at all. So people had to make do and figure out how to get along and manage their lives on their own. They kept gardens, they went fishing, they kept chickens, and they basically just took care of themselves. Almost everyone who lived there was either a new immigrant or the child of an immigrant or African-American. And so my book focuses on those people and their everyday lives at work, at play, things like their education, crime on the island. Basically, what was it like to live at this unusual place? And I was especially curious about that because this is a time in New York City history when so many parts of the city were incredibly densely populated. And this is very different. So over here, we have the school building. This is the new school. You'll hear about that later. And the teacher's cottage, because the teachers had to live on the island throughout the week. The water tower, there was never running water on the island. So this was to collect rainwater for the school and the teacher's cottage. This is one of the smokestacks that were sort of this ubiquitous feature in almost every photo of the island, any sort of macro photo like this. This is the Protestant church. And this is a teeny tiny little airport hangar, and this little object is a little tiny airplane. So Floyd Bennett Field was built on this site in the 1920s, but before that there was a tiny airstrip called the Barren Island Airport, um, privately owned. And just a couple more of the buildings. This is the, the much closer picture of the school with the teacher's cottage and the scrubby landscape again. Um, this is the Catholic Church, Sacred Heart Church, which was considered by the diocese as a Polish church. So that meant that they always had a Polish speaking priest. Uh, there was a resident priest for a few years and the rest of the time they would send priests from other churches in uh, Brooklyn. And I was able to actually go to the archives of the diocese and see the marriage book and the baptism book written by hand by the priest. So that was pretty, that was pretty cool. Um, so by the, this is like a mid-1930s shot. A lot of the photos are from the 30s. And there are very few photos from pre-1900. Um, so by this point, the factories had shut down. Um, there were a lot of complaints about the garbage smells, not from the islanders, but from people who lived in nearby seaside resorts and places like the Rockaways. Um, Dead horses were not, they didn't really need to deal with them anymore. There were cars now. Um, Flatbush Avenue had been built out to the island on a sort of causeway in the mid-20s. And then the city began 
building, um, putting in landfill to connect the island to the rest of Brooklyn. So it really wasn't an island anymore at this point. So in the late 1920s, um, Floyd Bennett Field was built. It was the first municipal airport in the city. Um, it was built practically on top of the village. People still live there. And this photo is from the opening of the airport. As you can see, it was very well attended. It feels a bit strange right now to see a crowd of all these people crowded together. But you can see this was a very big deal. Um, and these were this was like sort of the apex of aviation technology that people were exposed to here and were using. Um, it was very high tech for the time. And that was kind of spelled the end of the island. The islanders knew it wasn't going to last much longer. Um, the smokestack was a hazard to pilots. It had to come down. Um, in 1936, Robert Moses evicted the 400 or so people who still lived on the island in the name of building the Marine Parkway Bridge. Uh, they were able to easily evict people because the city owned the land. And then the following year, the bridge was built and they knocked down the smokestack um, so that the pilots didn't have that in their way. And this is really the really hollowed out um, view of the horse factory. And now if you go, the only remains you can see, the only built remains from Barren Island, I took this picture just a couple of years ago, are these decaying, excuse me, these decaying piers at Dead Horse Bay. Dead Horse Bay, of course, being named after the horse factories. Um, so when they built Flatbush Avenue out in the 20s, uh, they started, a, somebody started a ferry service between Barren Island and the Rockaways, which are very close. And so you would drive to Barren Island, park your car, get in a ferry, go to the Rockaways for the day, go to the beach, and then come back to your car. That lasted about 10 years, then they built the bridge and it, the ferry service was no longer needed. Um, so, and by the way, if you have been to Dead Horse Bay, if you've heard about it, you know that the beach is covered in garbage. That garbage is not Barren Island garbage. It was dumped there later in the 1950s. Um, so it's just a coincidence. So now I'm going to read you a bit from the book. I'm um, going to start with the introduction. I couldn't find any photos of this event, which was reported in the New York Times, but I did find a picture that I'll show you in a moment that um, kind of goes with the story. It's a, it's a drawing that was in a Brooklyn Daily Eagle article about a year before this story takes place. So this is from the introduction. One day in early March 1909, a New York City health inspector got on a boat at Canarsie Pier in Brooklyn and sailed to a place in that borough called Barren Island. In response to complaints from unspecified persons, he had come to find out who owned the more than 500 illicit hogs that roamed freely amid the sand, marsh plants, and garbage. It was legal to keep hogs in a pen, but not to let them roam. All of the islanders disclaimed any knowledge of the hogs, and presumably they assumed that was the end of the matter. But it was not. The 12 policemen of the health squad arrived by powerboat at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 16, 1909, a few days after the inspector's visit, revealing, quote, not a hint of their purpose. And all these quotes come from a report in the New York Times. These strapping men were armed to the teeth, the New York Times reported on the following day, with revolvers and 200 rounds of ammunition apiece. Led by city sanitary superintendent Walter Bensell, they had a singular mission, kill all the unpenned hogs on Barren Island. They would need all the strength they had to accomplish their assignment. Soon after they disembarked, their quarry began to appear all around them. A shot rang out and a big white hog rolled over on his back. From that moment, action was fast and furious, from the newspaper article. As the police dispersed across the island, they quickly discovered that their task would not be easy. First of all, the enormous creatures often had to be shot multiple times before they would fall dead. They obviously were more enormous than the pigs in this picture, which look pretty small. Um, more dauntingly, seemingly the entire female population of the island suddenly emerged from their homes to protect the very same hogs whom they'd claimed no knowledge of just days before. From the article, the women, few of whom could speak English, were crying and pleading with the policemen not to shoot the hogs, while between their sobs, they called what sounded like toy, 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 trying to get the rooters out of danger. Immune to this pleading, the brawny health police proceeded with their grim assignment. They strode across the sandy, roadless island, shooting every hog they could find, hogs of every description. From the article, some were so old and lazy they would hardly get out of the way when kicked, while others, long-legged, skinny, and shaggy as Shetland ponies, could give a deer the race of his life in a marathon. Although Barren Island's women presented the first line of defense, a number of men came from the factories to rescue their hogs, several picking up in their arms porkers which could not have weighed less than 150 pounds each, carrying them bodily into the houses through the front doors. In addition to the lucky hogs whose owners herded them into their homes, some others escaped into the nearby marshes. 
Several hours later, there were no more live hogs to be found outdoors. The policemen packed up their guns and headed back to the boat. Meanwhile, this is the last quote from the article, those of the natives who were not engaged in dragging in the dead hogs preparatory to a great fry and roast last night were at their gates, shaking warning fingers and menacing fists at the policemen's broad backs. So I love that story because I think it shows a lot about how Barren Island was kind of neglected and under the radar of the municipal authorities in so many ways. Keeping unpenned hogs had been illegal in the city for over 50 years at this point, but they were getting away with it for a really long time. Obviously, it was also a perfect place to keep hogs. They ate garbage, it was like free fresh meat, and there was no other real way to get fresh meat on the island unless you raised it yourself because deliveries were so inconsistent. You couldn't bring in meat and sell it at the tiny little grocery store. So in another way, it shows how islanders were self-sufficient. And it also shows that now and then they did come to the attention of the authorities and these sort of arbitrary random things would be done to enforce laws that many of the islanders had probably never even heard of. So this is, um, I want to tell you more about the factories because that was the whole reason why the island existed. This is also from Scientific American. It's kind of a cool schematic diagram of how they would press and boil the garbage and like flatten it out and make it into just, you know, they would extract the grease and just the rest of it would be this sort of ashy kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to read to you a little bit about the factories. Um, and here we go. The first factories on Barren Island in the 1840s or 50s undertook animal rendering. So by the way, this picture doesn't actually go with what I'm reading you. This is a garbage reduction picture and I'm reading to you about animal rendering. I just don't have a picture of that. Um, and the horse factory was also the last to go in 1934. By that time, the car had far overtaken the horse as a means of conveyance in New York City. But for many decades, thousands of horses a year were converted into a wide variety of products on Barren Island. Soon after the first factory on Barren Island opened, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle explained, the head bones are ground up and sold to the gold refiners who make use of it for refining that precious metal. The ribs are converted into manure, the thigh, jaw, and hip bones are calcined and used for refining sugar. The shin bones are converted into buttons and umbrella handles. From the hoofs, Prussian blue is made, and from the flesh, Prussiate of potash is manufactured. The clippings of the hides are boiled into glue. The hair of the manes and tails undergo the curling process and are used for stuffing mattresses. The remainder of the remains is converted into poudrette, which is a powdered fertilizer. How were these remains prepared to be transformed into everything from umbrella handles to mattress stuffing? The same article summarized the process as follows. A dead horse is brought to Barren Island by boat and dumped on the dock. Thence, it is carted to the vicinity of the factory and is divested of its hide. The body is quartered and the fat is carefully separated and placed in a receptacle for that purpose. The mane and tail are cut off and put in a separate place and the flesh is soothed, which means sort of plunged into the large cauldrons for boiling. After this process, the remains are divided and placed in separate heaps. The head bones, the ribs, thigh, jaw, and hip bones, hoofs, flesh, clippings of the hides, hair, and manure. The approach of this article is the same as virtually every other description of animal rendering on Barren Island. It is written in the passive voice, as if these processes took place by some sort of magic or automation. The horse is divested of its hide, not a professional skinner cuts the hide off the horse who did the divesting, the quartering, separating, and cutting. In reality, all of these tasks were performed by human beings who did very hard manual labor in hazardous conditions for at least 60 hours a week, often more. It is quite striking how consistent reporters and other visitors were in their explanations of these processes, almost entirely omitting the people who made them happen. And I won't read to you this part, but there are similar, very similar examples of writing about how the fish oil factories worked and how the garbage factory worked as if they just happened by magic. Um, a little bit more about the workers. As I mentioned, they were almost all new immigrants or African Americans. The labor force was very segmented. Black workers were basically all forced to work in the fish factories at first, which was considered the lowest and the lowest paid job because it was just so, it was hard to believe, but it was even smellier than the other jobs. The more sort of um, elite immigrants, were, the Germans were kind of at the top of the pile and they tended to be the skinners in the horse factory, which was the best paid job. Um, and of course at the fish factory where black workers 
uh, made up most of the workforce, all of the managers were white. And this is easily seen in the census reports, which reported people's occupation and their race at the time. Um, many of these black men had certainly been born into slavery. Um, they were born all in Delaware or Virginia. They were obviously recruited as groups and brought up together. Um, and, you know, so if you have a group of men, black men from Virginia in 1880 in the fish factory, you can assume that most of them, if not all, were born into slavery. Um, I found a classified ad from 1880 that from the Sun that said, wanted six colored men to work at fish factory on Barren Island. After the fish factories closed at uh, around 1900, um, there was still always a black population on the island uh, that was smaller um, and people were able to get other jobs in the other factories. So these, um, these places were really smelly and that is part of why they eventually were closed. I'm just gonna read to you a little bit about the smell. Nuisance complaints about Barren Island began to pile up in the late 1870s. Many of these were directed toward the New York State Board of Health and to the state legislature. In response, a number of laws were passed to attempt to force Barren Island factory owners to make their processes less smelly or close down. New Yorkers from off the island hailed the passage of each bill, as in 1899, when the World newspaper reported that, quote, the people who live in Brooklyn, Coney Island, Gravesend, Sheepshead Bay, Canarsie, Bergen Beach, Arverne, Edgemere, and the Rockaways can now rejoice that their nostrils will no longer be assailed by the powerful, putrid, pungent, penetrating, poisonous, prodigious odors that have arisen from Barren Island. Although the list of communities affected by this bill is quite lengthy, it omits any mention of Barren Island itself. And by the way, Brooklyn in that list is just referring to what we would call Brooklyn Heights now. One is left to wonder whether the islanders would be rejoicing or not, but either way, they were not worth mentioning from the point of view of the world's reporter. This stance was typical of reports about the Barren Island odors and was consistent with smell-related concerns elsewhere in 19th century America. As historian Melanie A. Keechel writes of this time, seemingly no one cared what air industrial laborers breathed. Popular ideas about the lower classes, particularly immigrants and racial others, precisely the population of Barren Island, held that these coarser individuals did not notice or care about filth. Indeed, newspaper articles about the stenches usually did not make any mention whatsoever of the Islanders. A representative example comes from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle of February 1st, 1881, which described factories, quote, in which the rendering of offal causes a terrible odor, which is a veritable plague to the residents of the country towns, especially in the summertime when their life is made unendurable. Similarly, on August 18th, 1888, the Evening World reported about Quote, barren Island with its bone boiling nuisances, the odors from which have so long assailed the noses of those who seek fresh air and recreation at the various beaches nearby. So no concern for the noses of the islanders. Um, one other little quick incident that I want to share. Um, in 1879, the Eagle reported on a lawsuit in which an islander, Thomas Murphy, sued the Brooklyn Railroad Company of the Eastern District after being thrown off a train because he allegedly smelled so bad. In fact, the railroad company had made a specific rule that barren islanders could not ride on its trains. Murphy's challenge was unsuccessful. The jury, quote, rendered, rendered a verdict for the defendant. It was then decided that although the railway company is a common carrier, that constitutional obligation does not include the transportation of smells. So that's work in the factories and the smells produced in the factories, but people did not work all the time. Um, their leisure activities were often quite different from those of other New Yorkers. One event that was quite special took place in 1918. You can see this is a, from a newspaper article, um, first auto trip on record to Barren Island. And underneath the picture, it says the Maxwell truck and its escort driving over the ice from, uh, on Jamaica Bay from Canarsie shore. And this is what was reported. Um, on January 27th, 27th, 1918, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle published an article about a surprising occurrence. Harold Rohde had driven a truck from Canarsie to Barren Island. The, the region was in the midst of a cold spell and Jamaica Bay had frozen over. Rohde, who had quote, large oyster and clam interests on Jamaica Bay, covered five miles over ice of unknown thickness, which was obviously completely nuts, um, along with a friend driving a car. After driving through a tin can dump, seemingly millions of cans of all sorts and sizes, both truck and touring car went on through the little village, startling the animals and amazing the populace, of whom fully 90% had never seen an automobile. Rody and friend gave the islanders rides and then drove back to Canarsie with several islanders flying along behind 
after having attached their sleds to the vehicles. So that was obviously an unusual occurrence and one that could not have occurred in most places in Brooklyn at the time or New York. Um, people obviously had more kind of everyday pastimes as well. One thing that I just want to point out about that, that happened in 1918. Many Islanders had never seen a car before. Ten years later, airplanes of the latest technology were taking off from the exact same place. So there was this incredibly quick transition on the island in the 1920s. A bit more about recreation. I was able to get hold of a, um, excuse me, of a oral history from uh, two different two different oral histories of people reminiscing about their childhoods on the island um, from around 1908 to around till 1935. Um, both of these people, Josephine Smizaski and William Meyer, both fondly recalled swimming in the ocean, fishing for recreation. Um, Here's a fishing picture. Obviously fishing is not only recreation, but provides food for your family. They also both remembered bonfires on the beach for election day and the 4th of July. The clamming, the rowboating, the fishing. Oh, Meyer remembered. Just walk, wandering around the island could be a satisfying form of recreation. My folks seem to let me roam a lot, Meyer said. My mother always said, yeah, Willie, he loads up. He takes all my prunes and apricots and raisins and apples. He loads up and he's gone half the day. So you just roam around the island for fun. There were also many recreational activities, both for children and for adults, that were brought to the island and became part of residents' daily lives. Meyer remembered roller skating in the school basement in the evenings after Jane Shaw, who met at the beginning, uh, obtained a donation of roller skates for all the children. Josephine Smizaski remembered the dance hall. Children played sports. There was a baseball field. Here's some people playing baseball. Um, Meyer actually remembered playing handball in the abandoned garbage factory buildings after that industry shut down in 1919. Sometimes kids just hung out and watched the world go by. After the Flatbush Avenue extension was built in 1926, Meyer said that he and his friends would watch the cars and quiz each other on the makes and models. So they took advantage of what was around, right? Um, a bit more about the factories in terms of municipal neglect. People didn't pay, the authorities, whether it was the town of Flatlands or the city of Brooklyn or the city of New York, never paid much attention to the island um, and the islanders. This is one of the factories and you can see this cool little image of this horse, this living live horse, carrying a load of something along this trackway. Um, there were fires there all the time. The buildings were made of wood. The processes in, the, in all the factories used heat and steam, and so there were constant scalding injuries and fires, and there was never any adequate fire protection. Um, they fought fires mostly with bracket brigades all the way till the end of the island, long after there was much more high-tech fire and effective firefighting equipment elsewhere. There were fireboats in Jamaica Bay and in New York Harbor, but they consistently never got to the island in time to make any difference when a fire would break out because it was just so spar from it everywhere else that they went. So I'm going to read to you a little bit about one particularly large fire on May 20th, 1906, at a time when the island's population had grown and the factories were handling more garbage. The population uh, peak was in 1910 on the census when there were about 1,800 people there. The New York Sanitary Utilization Company's plant in the fire was completely destroyed. The loss was reported as at least a million dollars, which is obviously a lot of money in 1906. Um, the city would now have no option but to dump garbage at sea until the plant was rebuilt. The local newspapers reported on this fire and its aftermath in quite sev several quite lengthy and prominently placed articles. As the Eagle observed, the flames spread with great rapidity for there was a brisk wind blowing. The handicap was the lack of facilities for putting out the fires. Um, so essentially, the, the factories did have some of their own privately owned firefighting equipment. Um, and they had some hoses, but there was no water pressure. The New York Tribune pointed out that the water supply seemed to be sufficient. Obviously, they're on an island, a tiny island, but there was a want of pressure. So it doesn't do you any good to have plenty of water if it won't, can't get it through the hoses. The local police substation summoned its commander from Canarsie, who in turn called for a fireboat. But by the time it arrived, it, quote, it was plain that the entire plant of the utilization company was doomed. The most the firemen could do was prevent the spread of the flame to the neighboring factories. The fireboat was not only slow, but also had never been at Barren Island before and had to find a skilled pilot before attempting to enter Rockaway Inlet. So the fireboats were basically useless. Local residents were reported to be extremely frightened by this fire. No wonder when there was, quote, an explosion of 1,200 barrels of oil followed by the big lurid flames which rose into the sky. Barren Island's small size made the prospect of a spreading fire very scary. 
According to the Tribune, several Polish laborers, maddened by the thought that they could not escape from the island, threw themselves into the bay and had to be rescued by boatmen. The newspaper made repeated references to the ethnic background of the laborers, perhaps implying that native-born Americans would not have reacted with such panic. Until the oil explosion, quote, the foreigners employed, employed on the island were kept together, but afterward they simply fell apart with fear. The New York Times also reported on the attempts of many Polish, Bohemian, and Italian islanders to escape, including excuse me, one woman who fell into the bay and was scolded in Bohemian by her husband for losing their pet parrot and marble clock. The patronizing tone of the report is telling and is consistent with other remarks about the immigrant population. So it really, um, this, that was a huge fire, probably the biggest one, but these fires happen very, very frequently and it never seemed to occur to the authorities to do anything about providing equipment. Um, I want to tell you now about the school. I'm a teacher, as Bo mentioned, and so this part of the story really um, has been especially interesting to me. This is a newspaper drawing from 1897. Uh, I, I think you can see at the bottom, it says the schoolhouse at Barren Island. At high tide, the building is surrounded by water. At low tide, the school stands in the center of a pestilence breeding marsh. From the top floor, a typhoid fever patient was taken yesterday. He had been ill a week. So this was the original school. As you can see, it's just a regular old two-story house. The bottom floor was the school and the top floor was this sort of apartment. Um, and at this point, 1897, Flatlands has been annexed to Brooklyn. So the Brooklyn uh, Board of Education had just taken over sort of jurisdiction over the Barren Island School. So they sent uh, a visit, you know, someone from the board came to check it out. They were checking out all the schools and they found that it was, this was the condition that it was in. They said they would build a new school building. They made this very nice kind announcement. They would build a new, this, this building held about, it was supposed to hold about 35 kids. There were 55 students at the time. There was one teacher only. And um, they said, okay, we're gonna build you a new school for 200 students, which was a good estimate of how many students uh, would need to go to school, but nothing was done. They didn't build it. And um, things went from bad to worse. So uh, that was in the uh, spring of 1897. In the fall, when the new school year started, the upper story of the school building was, and this is from the book, was occupied by a tenant family named Otz or Otzage, depending on which newspaper you read. The father of this family became seriously ill, perhaps with typhoid fever or black or malignant diphtheria. Fearing contagion, Principal Spencer Wallace notified the Board of Health and was instructed to close the school. Two Board of Health officials visited the island and Wallace took full advantage of their visit in the interest of reporters to register a number of alarming complaints. He said there were other cases of illness on the island, although the visitors were unable to find them, and that very close to the school were filthy ponds filled with refuse from the fish and fertilizer factories. A visiting reporter described one such pond located 50 feet behind the schoolhouse. In this pool, pigs wallow to their heart's content. This is before the big pig shoot. Uh, and refuse is dumped there without thought of removal, and the whole mass is left to decay under the sun. From it arises a smell that penetrates in all directions. The school building was clearly on its last legs. The same article described it as follows. The schoolhouse itself stands on six piles of rotten wood. The structure is open at the bottom, although a feeble attempt has been made to board it up. It is a two-story house, old and nearly fallen to pieces. The winds from the ocean have given it a slant, and Mr. Wallace, the teacher, is now unable to open the windows in the front of the schoolroom. The schoolroom occupies the whole floor downstairs and has a seating capacity for 30 scholars. At present, Mr. Wallace is crowding 56 into it every day that school opens, and he's the only adult there. So nothing happened. You know, they, everybody came and said, oh, this is terrible. We've got to do something about it. They did nothing. Then um, Brooklyn joined to the rest of New York City in 1898. So New York City Board of Education, which is all the way, I believe, in Manhattan at the time, um, or downtown Brooklyn, maybe where it is now. At any rate, they took over. They're very far away. So finally, in 1899, a new crisis occurred and forced the authorities to pay attention to the tiny school on the remote island that was undeniably, if improbably, part of the newly consolidated New York City. As the Eagle reported tersely on February 25th, Spencer A. Wallace, principal of the Barron Island School, is in the custody of the police. An examination will be made as to his sanity. He was taken into custody while loitering in front of the Hotel Brandon on Lower Fulton Street. He said he was engaged in an important work, that of watching some conspirators who were trying to ruin the school system of Brooklyn. 
As suggested by reports in several other newspapers, as well as the Eagle, Wallace had apparently suffered a mental breakdown after years working in intolerable conditions. Charles M. Chadwick, a school board member who took on a leadership role in responding to the situation, said that there was no doubt that the collapse of the principal was due to his worryment over the condition of the school, especially after a recent blizzard that had damaged the building further. Chadwick, the Board of Ed guide, attempted to visit Barron Island with the borough superintendent to investigate further, but perhaps fittingly, they were prevented from doing so because the bay was so rough that no tug captain would risk taking them over. As a result, officials had to rely on secondhand information as they tried to deal with the closed and deteriorating school. At the dock, Chadwick interviewed Islanders who were also waiting for a boat to make the crossing. They reported in general that, quote, all the arrangements for the school were scandalously bad and that even a well teacher would not have been able to manage. In Wallace's case, quote, of late he had been very irregular in holding sessions, often excusing the entire school after a few minutes work without apparent reason. An Islander quoted a bit later opined bluntly, he had probably been a good enough teacher in his day, but he was worn out when he came. You know, this is the dumping ground for worn out stuff and anything is thought to be good enough for us. So at that point, they really had to do something. There's no school functioning at all. Legally, the kids have a right to go to school. They did build a new school building. It took a couple of years for it to open up. So in the meantime, they managed to find a teacher here and there and hold classes in the Catholic church and places like that where they could have larger groups. And this is the new school. You've seen it in other pictures as well. Um, and next to it, you can't see in this picture, is the teacher's cottage. Um, and so things got better. This building has six classrooms and they hired a custodian and, you know, things were definitely in much better condition than at the old building. Um, but, you know, a lot of the kids still didn't go to school. They spent their days on the dump and the school only went through seventh grade. You couldn't go to high school if you'd been to this school. Um, and then in 1918, suddenly a, a member of the New York City Board of Education took a new great interest in the school. She heard that the school had been closed for over two weeks because the ferry had been canceled from bad weather and the teachers couldn't get back to the island. They typically would stay on the island Monday through Friday, go back to Brooklyn, the main part of Brooklyn, come back on Monday, they couldn't get back. Attendance was also extremely low. So she decided to go check it out. She was probably the first Board of Ed visitor since 1897. And she learned um, what was going on and decided to make improving the school her personal mission. So she found Jane Shaw, who I started with, um, who was really an incredible find. It was really lucky for the Islanders. The, um, the oral history that I have from Willie Meyer just goes on and on about how wonderful she was. Um, she had been teaching, quote, defective children at PS 12 on the Lower East Side. She was sort of well known as elementary school defective teachers go, defective child teachers go. And she just, she agreed to go for a year and she ended up staying for the entire rest of the life of the island until 1936. And um, I'm just going to read you a little bit and then summarize a bit more about her. She was very, um, so I already told you that she organized services for the Islanders during the Spanish flu pandemic when she first arrived. World War I is still going on. And she was also mindful of the benefits of portraying her students who were mostly immigrants themselves or children of immigrants as patriotic Americans. During World War I, Americans were encouraged to collect peach pits because they could be converted into activated charcoal, which was used in gas masks as an antidote to the chlorine gas used by the Germans. So Shaw organized peach pit collecting on the island. The students gathered 20 bushels, inspiring a letter from Marcus L. Philly, a Red Cross representative who wrote, when at the request of their principal, children will do work like this for their country, what splendid Americans we may look for as the boys and girls reach maturity. So she did a ton of stuff apart from just teaching and being the principal. She held English classes for the parents. She got trained in first aid because there was no medical care on the island at all. She got roller skates for the kids. She got a movie projector for the school. Um, she started teaching the eighth grade herself because she wanted the kids to be qualified to go to high school. At this point, uh, a few years into her time there, Flatbush Avenue had built it, been built out and it was realistic to take a bus and a lot of kids did take the bus to Erasmus Hall High School. Um, they could only do that if they completed the eighth grade. So she just taught it herself. Um, in 1935, she broke her hip at a school basketball game. And she was in her late 60s at the time and doctors judged that she could not survive the operation that would have been needed to, um, to help fix her hip. So she just lay down in her sitting room and taught the eighth grade from uh, lying on her back in her 
sitting room while her hip slowly healed. So she didn't really miss a beat. She just continued doing what she was doing. The kids would come to her house, move the furniture out of the way, have their lessons all day, then they would go home and then other visitors would come, littler kids or parents who had questions. And she continued doing her exact same job with her broken hip. Um, in 1936, there were about 400 people living still on the island. The factories had closed, but people had like odd jobs and went fishing and things. And she, uh, there were about 100 kids left in the school. Robert Moses issued eviction notices uh, for April and Jane Shaw wrote to him and said, please let the children finish the school year. And you know, if you know anything about him, he was not the most sympathetic and considerate guy, but he agreed and he, um, he let them finish the school year. He made the new eviction date the very next day after school ended, but it did make a difference. Um, so she retired at that point and moved back to Brooklyn. She was 70 or so at the time. She died at 72 on September 3rd, 1939, and was memorialized in an obituary in the Brooklyn Eagle that described her as, quote, the guardian angel of Barren Island. Put another way, as former resident Julie Gilligan said in a 2000 interview with the New York Times at the age of 80, she wasn't just a principal, she was a mother to everyone. So I just love Jane Shaw. Um, and she did a lot for the Islanders, but she also gave them a ton of credit for doing a lot for themselves. She never patronized them or talked down to them. So, and this is a drawing from the newspaper. So the airport came, the factories closed, the island was connected to Brooklyn, and it just passed out of existence, and most people forgot about it. And when I found out about it, I thought people should remember it. Um, and in conclusion, I just want to share a couple of quotes from a very unusual article in the Brooklyn Eagle in 1912. Most of the articles really were very patronizing towards the islanders and kind of made them seem like these bumbling primitive foreigners. Um, but in this article, they interviewed an unnamed prominent worker on the island. That's how they identified him. And he pointed out, everyone recognizes that this kind of work is important, but they're perfectly willing to let someone else do it and then look down on them for it, making a connection between the disgust for garbage and the disgust for garbage workers. He insisted that, quote, the people are the most industrious to be found anywhere. Everybody works and saves money. And Barren Islanders are better than a lot of folks and they leave better lives. There are about a thousand people over here, which is actually an underestimate. Um, mostly Poles, Russians with a small percentage of Italians, Swedes, Germans, and other nationalities. All good folks, steady workers, and good citizens. The worker was frustrated with the constant misrepresentation by outsiders. How the idea got about that these people were different from the rest of the world is more than I can understand. And he understood that outsiders arrived for visits already prepared with stereotypes of what they thought they'd see. You will find a lot of things you don't expect to find over there and you'll hardly ever find what you expect. And that is what I wanted to share with you. I really agree with him that the people who worked and lived on the island really needed to, should have been respected. And um, hopefully I, we can provide that respect belatedly today. This is a horse bone that I saw, found uh, at Dead Horse Bay just a few years ago. and. Um, that is sort of another remain of the island that you can still find there. And um, the, I'm going to stop the share. You're going to um, just bear with me for a minute. And I think that you see me now, but I am not sure. So I hope that that is working. Um, so I have some questions here that people sent through the Q&A. Um, the first one says, could you speak a bit more about utilities available to the islanders, plumbing, drinking water, electricity? There was no plumbing or drinking water. Um, that was just, people either dug wells or they collected rainwater or both. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Um, electricity, yes. Uh, towards the end, there was, there was electricity to the factories towards the end. There was electricity to the school and one or two other places. Willie Meyer, whose oral history I have, who was born on the island in 1917 and lived there until his family moved away in 1935, he described uh, there being electricity at just a few houses. There are electric poles um, on uh, pictures of the island from the mid-30s. So at some point later than the rest of the city, uh, electricity was put in. Um, the next question, uh, oh yeah, given that New York City was very segregated at the time, how did different folks get along? 
And the answer to that is that from all accounts, there are not very many, but I found a few accounts that all agreed that people got along fine, but kind of kept their separate com ethnic communities and racial communities. So Willie Meyer's parents were from Germany, and he described how his mother would hang out with the other German women. Um, and this is very consistent in different reports. There were no, there were very few reports of any kind of inter-ethnic strife, but people tended to spend time with people from their same community, which obviously is a characteristic of immigrant communities in many places. Um, then there's the African American community, which obviously was the only group that was born in the United States for the most part. And they also had kind of a neighborhood of the island that was considered the black area. Um, so I haven't, it, it seems like everybody basically got along, but didn't interact much. At the school, they must, the children must have interacted, but I was able to, there's one picture of a white girl and a black girl sitting next to each other at the school, but it's very posed and it, there's no way to infer from that whether kids really were mixing at school or not. Um, the second part of that question asked, did I find any stench maps from the island at the time? No, I have found other stench maps that focus on places like you know, stench maps are kind of what they sound like. It's maps of where the smelly nuisance industries were. I have found ones um, in Manhattan, like the Hell's Kitchen area, and also um, in Newtown Creek area, Gowanus, but I have not found, I mean, Barren Island was considered so sort of peripheral that I have not found it on any of those maps. Um, the next question says, can you speak more to the African-American population on the island? I wish I could. Um, there were definitely families. That's part of the question. Um, there were families, uh, at, which is easy to see on the census. Um, and the part of the question says, were they accepted? Again, as far as I have been able to make out, they were accepted in the sense that there was not any like overt, um, there was not any overt conflict. Uh, they were relegated, as I mentioned, to lower totem pole jobs and lower paid jobs in the factories. Uh, but there were lots of black women and children as well as the men uh, after the initial couple of decades. Um, as far as the next question says, how about infrastructure and services? Was there a post office? No, there was not a post office. So you had to just give your letters to the boat people and they would take it to Canarsie and mail it. Um, did police patrol and what crime was like? Yeah, I have a whole chapter about that that I didn't read from. Um, so for much of the island, um, there, was not, there was not a lot of policing at first. After a while, they started sending police in shifts um, to this, what they call the substation on the island. So police would come from Canarsie, again, when they could get over there on their boats. If there was some big problem, it's, you know, it would take hours to get the police to come. Um, and eventually they had one resident policeman, this guy, William Evans, who really enjoyed living on the island and whose wife was a native islander and actually helped him in a lot of his investigations because she kind of had the trust of the islanders having grown up there. Almost all the crime that's referred to is bar brawls. Uh, then pro when prohibition came, that sort of dried up. There are some other crimes that are sort of interesting, like the, um, big fancy hotels in Manhattan and big fancy clubs had these arrangements with the garbage factory that when silverware got thrown out in the garbage un inadvertently that the Barren Island factories would return it and every uh, one of these hotels had like their little um, you know insignia on the silverware so they were supposed to pull all that stuff out and send it back to the hotels and so some workers realized like we can just like take this stuff and sell it to silver dealers and make a little money and so that happened a couple of times that silver dealers were arrested with tons of Barren Island silver. They never found the, or didn't, maybe they didn't try to find the workers who were providing this stuff. So that was kind of a more um, specific type of crime that was very opportunistic at Barren Island. Uh, but in general, people talked about how peaceful the island was and how little crime there was. Everybody left their doors unlocked and things like that. Um, then the question, the next question after that is how did pollution affect the oyster industry? Um, I mean, it destroyed the oyster industry, but I don't know how much of that pollution relates to the Barren Island factories. That answer, I don't know. Um, obviously, there was lots of, of other industry in the New York City area at the time, and um, my guess is that the Barren Island part of that probably didn't contribute too much. It probably actually made it less um, polluted because the garbage was being processed at the factories instead of dumped in the ocean. Um, wasn't there a hotel on the island at one point? Yes, there was a hotel called the Empire Hotel. I 
have a couple of pictures of it in the book. If we have time, I can look and see if I can hold a picture up to the screen or something. Um, yeah, I mean, there. Some, it's sometimes hard to tell whether hotel really means a place where you can spend the night or more of just like a saloon with a one or two rooms. Um, so yes, there was a hotel there. Like at the peak of the population, there were a number of small retail businesses. There were grocery stores. There was a pharmacist who was kind of like a quack and, and got in trouble a lot. Um, there were other like little shops. Willie Meyer describes this man who would um, catch fish and then kind of corral them in a pen while they were still alive and you could go buy live fish from him. So people did their own kind of like little mini retail enterprises at the time and there was a hotel. Um, the next question says, recently there has been an interest in the history of the area, not from the natives of Brooklyn, but the newcomers. Why do you think there has been such a renewed interest in the area? Um, I'm not sure if this person meant like specifically the Barren Island area or just the Brooklyn area. I mean, I think Brooklyn obviously has developed this sort of like cachet as a very kind of cool or special place. And so maybe that accounts for the interest of newcomers um, in the history of it. But I don't know if I have a better answer than that to that one. Um, what do I know about the period of time when the airfield and the community coexisted? Was there interaction? Any news stories? Yeah, this is actually a really fun part of the airport chapter of my book. Willie Meyer and also lots of other newspaper articles talk about the interactions between the pilots and the islanders. So, you know, there were a lot of stunt pilots called, they were called barnstormers who would come to Barron Island, particularly before Floyd Bennett Field when it was just the Barron Island airport. And they would do these like little stunt flights. They really had no idea what they were doing. Half the time they would like crash into the bay. There were tons of accidents and people would, you know, watch people sometimes crash to their deaths actually. But there were other more pleasant forms of entertainment with the planes. The kids would give the pilots little, um, parachutes like to drop off of the plane and see where it would land and the pilots would take people up for a few bucks for like a little spin in the air so there was definitely a lot of interest in aviation Willie Meyer was interviewed when he was in his mid 90s he remembered the name of every single airplane model that he had seen um, he talked about the specific there were lots of really famous pilots who took off from Barron Island and from Floyd Bennett Field from Amelia Earhart to you know, all kinds of people. So the Islanders were really fascinated by the airport and interacted a lot with the pilots. Um, where did most of these people go when they were evicted? That I don't know. Um, I, try, I, I would have had to really delve many more hours into the census and I don't know how far I would have gotten. Um, as far as I know, they didn't stay together. A lot of people had left before the actual eviction um, because they could see the writing on the wall. The garbage factory closed in 1919. A lot of people left then. Willie Myers' family left in 1935. They bought a farm upstate and moved upstate, which he, where he was miserable because there was no one to hang out with. Um, but I don't know where most people went. Um, the next question is, how do you engage in a research project like this? Where do you begin and how do you proceed? So I first heard about Marin Island in a book called The Fat of the Land, which is by um, a guy named Benjamin, Mil Benjamin Miller, and it tells the story of garbage in New York City. Um, so he had just a few pages about it. Most of his sources were newspaper articles. So I started by using just newspapers.com and the Brooklyn Public Library's free access to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. I read tons of newspaper articles. Um, I also used a lot of census reports. I also used the Catholic Diocese archives. I used Board of Health archives in Albany. Um, I used the Municipal Archives, which has the Board of Ed archives in it. Um, like all the stories about the principal who lost his mind, that's recorded in the New York City Board of Education archives as well as in the news. Um, I think those were the main sources as long as well as these oral histories that I got through one through just a personal connection and the other was done by a parks ranger because the land is now part of Gateway National Recreation Area. So it's managed by New York or by United States Park Rangers. Um, the next question was please talk more about the artifacts on Glass Bottle Beach. I'll do that briefly, but it's really not connected even though I love 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 going there and finding stuff um, so in the 1950s there was still more landfilling going on to kind of shore up the land there a lot of landfill was placed um, uh, not as you know as like just to create more land not as a garbage dump in that area and it was not properly capped 
So in about the 1980s, the caps or whatever there was there trying to hold it down burst and it's been coming up out of the sand ever since. Everything that you find there with a date on it is from the early 50s. Um, I just was today looking through a newspaper, a chunk of newspaper that I found there a few months ago and trying to peel it apart. And every, it's from 1952. Um, so it's not related to the island. The only stuff you find on the beach related to the island is the horse bones. Um, but those artifacts are super cool and everybody should go check them out. Does Jake have any living descendants? No, she did not have children and she was from this family of teachers. Uh, none of them uh, had got, got married and had kids, but one of them adopted three children and I've not been able to track them down. So in Jane Shaw's family, there were no blood descendants. There were these three children who were adopted by her sister who was also, all of the sisters were teachers. Um, I would love to find any relative. I don't know if there were like nieces or, you know, not her, her direct family, but cousins or some other connection to Jane Shaw. That would be amazing. I actually went to Utica in the sort of pilgrimage to her grave and to her childhood home a few years ago. And that's another person that's helpful to me is the town historian of Deerfield, New York, which is just outside of Utica, who um, provided me with some newspaper articles from up there. Um, the next question says, besides educators, were progressive era reformers interested in Barren Island at the turn of the century? Did they want to try to reform the populace? A little bit. There was an effort, I don't remember in what year, and I probably can't find it right now quickly enough, but there was this effort to do this sort of domestic education, and the idea being that the immigrant women really had no idea how to run a household, how to cook, how to raise healthy children. They didn't know any of that stuff and had to be educated by the well-meaning Americans. And the only reports I found about that are from the point of view of these reformers who thought that they did a really, really excellent job um, with the population there. But I didn't find any evidence of, I mean, my challenge the whole time was like, where's the voice of the Islanders, which was really hard to find. I did find it in those oral histories and in the, some of, a lot of the Board of Ed records are like transcripts of hearings about the smells. And so there you can hear the voices of the Islanders saying it really doesn't smell that bad and I'm perfectly healthy. Um, but I never, I wished I could find some, you know, what did these women think of these like American white women coming in and saying like, you're doing this all wrong and here's how you have to do it. I don't know. Um, that was kind of an, un, it, that was not consistent. That happened for a couple of years and then they were left alone. There was also this sort of Protestant self uh, described missionary who opened the Protestant church there, which was not a success at all. It was only open for about maybe 15 years and nobody really came to it very much and they closed it. Um, would I explain the chart on the wall behind me? Yes. Um, I'm sitting this way very deliberately. So the periodic table of New York City trash I bought at the Queens Museum when there was an exhibit of the New York City Sanitation Department's artist in residence. Her name is Meryl Laterman Eucalys. And she has done a lot of work uh, sort of trying to honor garbage workers, which is obviously part of my goal as well. And so that I bought at the Queen's Museum shop when um, she had her exhibit and it has practically every kind of litter that you can possibly imagine that you will find on a New York City street from parking tickets to cigarette butts to all kinds of other stuff. Um, if you wanted to get there to visit, could you? Well, you can easily go under normal circumstances by public transit to Floyd Bennett Field um, and Dead Horse Bay. I mean, it's a little hard for me to sort of place on the map of what's there now, what, uh, where everything was in Barron Island, but essentially it's Floyd Bennett Field, which if you're driving from Brooklyn to the Rockaways, Floyd Bennett Field is on your left, right before the Marine Parkway Bridge to the Rockaways and Dead Horse Bay is to your right. Um, and so I take public transit, which I can't do right now to get there, um, but you can also drive there. There's parking lots and it's part of Gateway National Recreation Area. Has there been any attempt to create a museum on the island to preserve this history? There is a tiny exhibit in the visitor center of Gateway. Um, it's called the Ryan Visitor Center. There's a tiny little exhibit about um, Barren Island, but most of their educational sort of efforts are geared towards memorializing the airport, much more so than Barren Island. Um, then somebody asked uh, why Barren Island, Jasper, who I happen to know, would like to know why Barren Island was chosen for the animal rendering and dump. So good question, Jasper. Um, I don't think I did mention that. Um, it's basically because it was far enough away 
uh, that people thought the smells wouldn't bother most New Yorkers, but it was still close enough to make it reasonable to put a bunch of garbage on the boat in Manhattan and take it over there. So it was kind of like this in-between place that was close enough to get to without too much trouble, but far enough away that the smells wouldn't bother the fancy people living in Manhattan. Um, what's my next project? I'm not completely sure, but I have been studying with my students on the history of Stuyvesant Town and before Stuyvesant Town, which is very close to our school, was built, um, it was a neighborhood called the Gas House District, which is somewhat similar. It was another neighborhood of nuisance industries. It was another neighborhood where people were evicted by Robert Moses, uh, in this case, in the name of just totally raising the entire neighborhood and creating Stuyvesant Town. Um, and so I have started doing a little bit of research about the Gas House District, but I'm not sure if it will turn into another book or just research for my own interest. So thank you so much for all those great questions because they allowed me to talk about a lot of things that I didn't get to talk about. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you for attending wherever you are. Bye.